Hi, everybody. This is Allison from Malachite Creations. How are you? Hi. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you have yet to do so. And if you get anything from my work, I'll connect the dot in Epiphany, a mind blown moment, a new book to read, a new author to explore, artwork, oracle cards, all that fun stuff is in the description below. LA Cat Creations 211.com is my website. You can see all my fabulous artwork and all the links to everything also is there. So if you don't see it down there in the, in the information section, you can go onto my website and check out all my artwork. I have yet to put update stuff yet. Life is bonkers. And I do apologize. I always do. I shouldn't, but I feel it's necessary sometimes. Um, I had a job interview the other day. I don't know if I got the job yet, but crossing fingers, I do. I need steady income. <laughs> Fun times. Um, so this is going to be interesting rollout. If this does happen, how I'm going to conduct my life, but that's okay. Change is here. And it's ready to be embraced. <laughs> the Arantia book. Paper 64. The Evolutionary Races of Color. I will let the book speak for itself. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. This is the story of the evolutionary races of Urantia from the days of Adon and Fanta almost 1 million years ago, down through the times of the planetary prince to the end of the Ice Age. The human race is almost 1 million years old, and the first half of its story roughly corresponds to the pre-planetary prince days of Urantia. The latter half of the history of mankind begins at the end of the arrival of the planetary prince and the appearance of the six colored races, and roughly corresponds to the period commonly regarded as the old stone age uh shanna dean talks about five so we can crisscross work here the and onic aborigines primitive man made his evolutionary appearance on earth a little less than one million years ago and he had a vigorous experience he instinctively sought to escape the danger of mingling with the inferior simian tribes but he could not migrate eastward because of the arid Tibetan land elevations 30,000 feet above sea level. Neither could he go south nor west because of the expanded Mediterranean Sea, which when extended eastward to the Indian Ocean. And as he went north, sorry, I lost my place there. He encountered the advancing ice, but even when further mitig migration sorry, was blocked by the ice, and though the dispersing tribes became increasingly hostile, the more intelligent groups never entertained the idea of going southward to live among their hairy tree-dwelling cousins of inferior intellect. Many of the man's earliest religious emotions grew out of his feeling of helplessness in the shut-in environment of this geographic situation, Mountains to the right, water to the left, and ice in front. But this progressive and the knights would not turn back to their inferior tree-dwelling tree relatives in the south. These Adonites avoided the forests in contrast with the inhabitants of their non-human relatives. In the forests, man has always deteriorated. Human evolution has made progress only in the open and in the higher latitudes. The cold and hunger of the open lands stimulate action, invention, and resourcefulness. While these Adenic tribes were developing the pioneers of the present human race amidst the hardships and privations of these rugged northern climes, their backward cousins were luxuriating in the south tropical forests of the land of these early common origin these events occurred during the times of the third glacier 
The first, according to the reckoning of geologists, the first two glaciers were not extensive in Northern Europe. During the most of the Ice Age, England was connected by land with France, while later on Africa was joined to Europe by the Sicilian land bridge. At the time of the Andonic migrations, there were a continuous land path from England to the west on through Europe, <laughs> on through Europe and Asia to Java in the east. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But Australia was again isolated which further attenuated the development of its own peculiar fauna. 950,000 years ago, the descendants of Andon and Fanta had migrated far to the east and to the west. To the west, they passed over Europe to France and England. In later times, they penetrated eastward as far as Java, where their bones were so recently found, the so-called Java man and their then journeyed on to Tasmania. The groups going west became less contaminated with the backward stocks of mutual ancestral origin than those going east, who mingled so freely with their retarded animal cousins. I'm not a fan of that word. These unprogressive individuals drifted southward and presently mated with the inferior tribes, later on increasing numbers of their mongrel descendants returned to the north to meet with the rapidly expanding Adenic peoples, and such unfortunate unions unfailingly deteriorated the superior stock. Few and fewer and fewer of the primitive settlements maintained the worship of the breath, the breath giver. These early dawn civilization was threatened with extinction, and thus it has ever been on your rancha civilizations of great promise have successfully deteriorated and had finally been extinguished by the folly of allowing the superior freely to procreate with the inferior. The foxhole peoples. 900,000 years ago, the arts of Adon and Fanta and the culture of Angar were vanishing from the face of the earth. Culture, religion, and even flint working were at their lowest ebb. These were the times when large numbers of inferior Mongol groups were arriving in England from southern France. These tribes were so largely mixed with the forest ape-like creatures that they were scarcely human. They had no religion but were crude flint workers and possessed sufficient intelligence to kindle fire. They were followed in Europe by somewhat superior and prolific people whose descendants soon spread over the entire continent from the ice to the north to the Alps and the Mediterranean in the south. These tribes are the so-called Helde Heldeberg race, Heid Heidelberg. During the long period of cultural descendants, the Foxtail peoples of England and the Baban tribes northwest of India continued to hold on to some of the traditions of Adon and certain remnants of the culture of Anagar. The Fox Hall peoples were furthest west and succeeded in retaining much of the Adonic culture. They also preserved their knowledge of flint working, which they transmitted to their descendants, the ancient ancestors of the Eskimos. Through the remains of the Fox Hall peoples, were the last to be discovered in England, these Adonites were really the first human beings to live in those regions. At the time, the land bridge still connected France with England, and since most of the early settlements of the Adon descendants were located along the rivers and seahorses of their early day, they are now under the waters of the English Channel and the North Sea, but some three or four are still above water on the English coast. These pages are paper thin. Many of the more intelligent and spiritual of the foxhole peoples maintained their racial superiority and perpetual, perpetuated their primitive religious customs. And these people, as they were later admixed with subsequent stocks, journeyed on west from England after a later ice visitation and have survived as the present-day Eskimos. The bad on Benanan tribes, I know I'm butchering these words and I do apologize, 
Besides the foxhole peoples in the West, another struggling center of culture persisted in the East. This group was located in the foothills of the Northwestern Indian Highlands among the tribes of Bad Onanen. Maybe I'm saying that right now. A great, great grandson of Adon. These people were the only descendants of Adon who never practiced human sacrifice. These highland Bananites occupied an extensive plateau surrounded by forests, traversed by streams, and abounding in game. Like some of their cousins in Tibet, they lived in crude stone huts, hillside grottos, and semi-underground passages. While the tribes in the north grew more and more to fear the ice, those living near the homeland of their origin became exceedingly fearful of the water. They observed the Mesopotamian Peninsula gradually sinking into the ocean, and though it emerged several times, the traditions of these primitive races grew up around the dangers of the sea and the fear of periodic engulfment. And this fear, together with their experience with river floods, explains why they sought out the highlands as a safe place in which to live. To the east of Bananon, peoples in the Sai Walk Hills of northern India may be found fossils that approach nearer to transition types between man and the various pre-human groups than any others on Earth. 850,000 uh, years ago, the superior Bannon tribes began a warfare of extermination directed against their inferior and animalistic neighbors. In the less than 1,000 years, most of the borderland animal groups of this region had been either destroyed or driven back to the southern forests. This campaign for the extermination of inferiors brought about a slight improvement in the hill tribes of that age, and the mixed descendants of this improved Babanite stock appeared on the stage of action as an apparently new people, the Neanderthal race. The Neanderthal, Neanderthal races. The nether, ne Let me restart that again, guys. Wow, my brain. The Neanderthalers were excellent fighters and they traveled extensively. They gradually spread from the highland centers in the northwest India to France on the west, China on the east, and even down into northern Africa. They dominated the world for almost half a million years until the times of the migration of the evolutionary races of color. 800,000 years ago. Game was abundant. Many species of deer, as well as elephants and hippos, roamed over Europe. Cattle were plentiful, horses and wolves were everywhere. The Neanderthalers were great hunters, and the tribes in France were the first to adopt the practice of giving the most successful hunters the, the choice of women for wives. The reindeer was highly useful to these Neanderthal people, serving as food, clothing, and for tools, since they made various types of horns and bones. They had little culture, but they greatly improved the work in Flint until it almost reached the levels of the days of Adon. Large flints attached to wooden handles came back into use and served as axes and picks. 750,000 years ago, the fourth ice sheet was well on its way south. With their improved implements, the Neanderthalers made holes in the ice covering the northern rivers and thus were able to spear the fish which came up to these vents. Ever, these tribes retreated before the advancing ice, which at this time made it its most extensive invasion of Europe. In these times, the Siberian glacier was making its southernmost march, compelling early man to move southward back toward the lands of his origin, but the human species had so differentiated that the danger of further mingling with its non-progressive simian relatives was greatly lessened. 700,000 years ago, the fourth glacier, the greatest of all in Europe, was, re was in recession. Man and animals, animals were returning north. The climate was cold and moist and primitive man again thrived in Europe and Western Asia. Gradually, the forest spread north over land, which had been so recently covered by the glacier. 
mammalian life had been little changed by the great glacier these animals persisted in that narrow belt of land lying between the ice and the alps and upon the retreat of the glacier again rapidly spread over all europe they arrived from africa over the sicilian land bridge straight tusk elephants broad-nosed rhinoceroses hyenas and african lions and these new animals virtually exterminated the saber-toothed tigers and the hippopotamuses. <clears throat> 650,000 years ago, witnessed a continuation of the mild climate by the middle of the interglacial period. It had become so warm that the Alps were almost denuded of ice and snow. 600,000 years ago, the ice had reached its then northernmost point of retreat. And after a pause of a few thousand years, started south again on its fifth excursion. But there was little modification of climate for 50,000 years. Man and the animals of Europe were little changed. The slight aridity of the former period lessened and the alpine glaciers descended far down the river valleys. 550,000 years ago, the advancing glacier again pushed man and the animals south. But this time, man had plenty of room in the wide belt of land stretching northeast into Asia and lying between the ice sheet and then greatly expanded Black Sea extension of the Mediterranean. These times of the fourth and fifth glaciers witnessed the further spread of the crude culture of the Neanderthal races. But there was so little progress that it truly appeared as though the attempt to produce a new and modified type of intelligent life on Urantia was about to fail. For almost a quarter of a million years, these primitive people drifted on hunting and fishing by spells, improving in certain directions, but on the whole steadily retrogressing as compared with their superior ethnic ancestors. During these spiritually dark ages, the culture of superstitious mankind reached its lowest levels. The Neanderthalers really had no religion beyond the shameful superstition. They were deathly afraid of clouds, more especially of the mists and fogs. A primitive religion of their fear of natural forces gradually developed, while animal worship declined as improvement in tools with abundance of game enabled these people to live with lessened anxiety about food. The sex rewards of the chase tended greatly to improve the hunting skill. The new religion of fear led to attempts to placate the invisible forces behind these natural elements and culminated later on in the sacrificing of humans to appease these invisible and unknown physical forces. And this terrible practice of human sacrifice has been perpetuated by the more backward peoples of your rancher right on down to the 20th century. It still continues today. These early Neanderthalers could hardly be called sun worshippers. They rather live in fear of the dark and they had mortal dread of nightfall. As long as the moon shone a little, they managed to get along. But in the dark of the moon, they grew panicky and began the sacrifice of their best specimens of manhood and womanhood in an effort to induce the moon again to shine. The sun, they early learned, would regularly return, but the moon, they conjectured, only returned because they sacrificed their fellow tribesmen. As the race advanced, the object and purpose of sacrifice progressively changed, but the offering of human sacrifice as a part of religious ceremonial longed persisted. Origin of the colored race is... 500,000 years ago, the Baban tribes of the northwestern highlands of India became involved in another great racial struggle. For more than 100 years, this restless warfare raged, and when the long fight was finished, only about 100 families were left. But these survivors were the most intelligent and desirable of all the then living descendants of Adon and Fanta. And now, among these highland Bamanites, they were there was a new and strange occurrence a man and a woman living in the northeastern part of then inhabited highland region began suddenly to produce a family of unusually intelligent children this was the sangic family the ancestors of the six colored races of urantia 
These Sangic children, 19 in number, were not only intelligent above their fellows, but their skins manifested a unique tendency to turn various colors upon exposure to sunlight. Among these 19 children were five red, two orange, four yellow, two green, four blue, and two indigo. Chakra colors, anybody? These colors became more pronounced as the children grew older. And when these youths later mated with their fellow tribesmen, all of their offspring tended toward the skin color of the Sangic parent. And now I interrupt the chronological narrative after calling attention to the arrival of the planetary prince. At about this time, while we separate, consider the six Sangric races of Urantia. The six Sangric races of Urantia on an average evolutionary planet, the six evolutionary races of color appeared one by one. The red man is the first to evolve, and for ages he roams the world before the succeeding colored races make them appearance. The simultaneous emergence of all six races on Urantia and, and in one family was most unusual. The appearance of the earlier Adonites on Urantia was also something new in Satania. On no other world in the local system has such a race of will creatures evolve in the advance of evolutionary race of color. The red man, these people were remarkable specimens of the human race in many ways superior to Adon and Fanta. They were the most intelligent group and were the first of the Sangic children to develop a tribal civilization and government. They were always Monogalous, even their mixed descendants seldom practiced plural mating. In later times, they had serious and prolonged trouble with their yellow brethren in Asia. They were aided by their early invention of the bow and arrow, but they had unfortunately inherited much of the tendency of their ancestors to fight among themselves, and this so weakened them that the yellow tribes were able to drive them off the Asiatic continent. About 85,000 years ago, the comparatively pure remnants of the red race went in mass across to North America, and shortly thereafter, the Bering Land Isthmus sank, thus isolating them. No man, no red men ever returned to Asia, but throughout Siberia, China, Central Asia, India, and Europe, they they left behind much of their stock blended with other colored races. When the red man crossed over to, into America, he brought along much of the teachings and traditions of his early origin. His immediate ancestors have been touched with the later activities of the world headquarters of the planetary prince. But in a short time after reaching the Americas, the red man began to lose sight of these teachings and there occurred a great decline in intellectual and spiritual culture. Very soon, these people again fell to fighting so fiercely among themselves that it appeared that these tribal wars would result in the speedy extinction of this remnant of the comparatively pure red race. Because of this great retrogression, the red man seemed doomed when about 65,000 years ago, I'm going to try very hard to pronounce this name, Ona Mana Longton, appeared as their leader and spiritual deliverer. He brought the temporary peace among the American red men and revived their worship of the great spirit. Ona Mona Longton lived to be 96 years of age and maintained his headquarters among the great redwood trees of California. Many of his later descendants have come down to modern times among the Blackfoot Indians. As time passed, the teachings of Ona Mona Longton became hazy traditions. Intercene wars were resumed and never after the days of this great teacher did another leader succeed in bringing universal peace among them. Increasingly, the more intelligent strains perish in these tribal struggles. Otherwise, a great civilization would have been built upon the North American continent by these able and intelligent red men. After crossing over to America from China, the Northern red man never again came in contact with other world influences ex except the Eskimo until his later discovered by the white man. It was most unfortunate that the red man almost completely missed his opportunity of being upstepped by the admixture of the later Adamic stock. 
as it was, the red man could not rule the white man, and he would not willingly serve him. In such a circumstance, if the two races do not blend, one or the other is doomed. The orange man. The outstanding characteristic of this race was their peculiar urge to build. To build anything and everything, even to the piling up of vast mounds of stone, just to see which tribe could build the largest mounds. Though they were not a progressive people, they profited much from the schools of the prince and sent delegates there for instruction. The orange race was the first to follow the coastline southward toward Africa as a Mediterranean sea withdrew to the west, but they never secured a favorable footing in Africa and were wiped out of existence by the later arriving green race. Before the end came, this people lost much cultural and spiritual ground, but there was a great revival of higher living as a result of the wise leadership of Horshunta, the mastermind of this unfortunate race, who ministered to them when their headquarters was at Armageddon some 300,000 years ago. The last great struggle between the orange and the green man occurred in the region of the lower Nile Valley in Egypt. This long drawn out battle was waged for almost 100 years. And as its close was very few of the orange race were left alive. This shattered remnants of these people were absorbed by the green and by the latter arriving indigo men. But as a race, the orange man ceased to exist about 100,000 years ago. The yellow man, the primitive yellow tribes, were the first to abandon the chase, establish settlement communities, and develop a home life based on agriculture. Intellectually, they were somewhat inferior to the red man, but socially and collectively, they proved themselves superior to all of the Sangic peoples in the matter of fostering racial civilization because there developed a fraternal spirit, the various tribes learning to live together in relative peace, they were able to drive the red race before them as they gradually expanded into Asia. They traveled far from the influences of the spiritual headquarters of the world and drifted into great darkness following the Castiglia apostasy. But they occurred one brilliant age among the people when Singleton, about 100,000 years ago, assumed the leadership of this tribe and proclaimed the worship of the one truth. The survival of comparatively large numbers of the yellow race is due to their intribal peacefulness. From the days of Singlington to the times of the modern China, the yellow race has been numbered among the more peaceful of the nations of Urantia. The race received a small but potent legacy of their later import atomic stock. The Green Man. The green race was one of the less able groups of primitive man, and they were greatly weakened by extensive migrations in different directions. Before their dispersion, these tribes experienced a great revival of culture under the leadership of Fantad some 350,000 years ago. The green race split into three major divisions. The northern tribes were subdued, enslaved, and absorbed by the yellow and blue races. The eastern group were amalgamated with the Indian peoples of those days and remnants still persist among them. The Southern nation entered Africa where they destroyed their almost equally inferior orange cousins. In many ways, both groups were evenly matched in this struggle since each carried strains of the giant order, many of their leaders being eight and nine feet in height. These great giant strains of the green man were most confined to the southern or Egyptian nation. The remnants of the victorious green men were subsequently absorbed by the indigo race, the last of the colored peoples to develop and immigrate from the original Sangic center of race dispersion. The blue man, the blue men were a great people. They, they early invented the sphere and subsequently worked out the rudiments of many of the arts and modern civilization. The blue man had the brain power of the red man associated with the soul and sentiment of the yellow man. The atomic descendants preferred them to all of the latter persistent color races. 
The early blue men were responsive to the persuasions of the teachers of Prince Castiglia's staff and were thrown into great confusion by the subsequent perverted teachings of those traitorous leaders. Like other primitive races, they never fully recovered from the turmoil produced by the Castiglia betrayal, nor did they ever completely overcome their tendency to fight among themselves. About 500 years after Castiglia's downfall of widespread revival of learning and religion of a primitive sort, but none the less real and beneficial occurred. Olandoff became a great teacher among the blue race and led many of the tribes back to the worship of the true God under the name of the Supreme Chief. This was the greatest advance of the blue men until those latter times when this race was so greatly upset by the mixture of the atomic stock. The European researches and explorations of Old Stone Age have largely to do with unearthing the tools, bones, and art craft of these ancient blue men, for they persisted in Europe until recent times. The so-called white race of Urantia are the descendants of these blue men as they were first modified by slight a mixture with yellow and red, as they were later greatly upstepped by assimilating the greater proportion of the violet race. The indigo race, as the red man, were the most advanced of all the Sengic peoples, so the black men were the least progressive. They were the last to migrate from their highland homes. They journeyed to Africa, taking possession of the continent, and have ever since remained there, except they have been forcibly taken away from age to age slaves. Pause. Whose narrative is this? Because this is not the real narrative. I am just saying I don't agree with this. And a side note from my understandings and knowings, I'm just going to input something. These people were the most powerful race. They had the most illumined light beings as souls. So for anybody that can read this and still go amongst that narrative, the Darwin narrative, you got to really start questioning reality. There's a reason why certain cultures and races and languages and other sorts of things are suppressed. There's a lot of fear when you see how powerful people are, you kind of you kind of put them down, you kind of out with them. And then this shit comes out. They're very powerful. And I hope those who are of color that are listening to me step in your empowerment. And I wouldn't believe this for a minute. At all, in fact. Isolated in Africa, the indigo peoples, like the red man, received little or none of the race elevation, which would have been derived from the infusion of the atomic stock. Alone in Africa, the indigo race made little advancement until the days of Orvanian, Orvanon, when they experienced a great spiritual awakening. While they later almost entirely forgot the gods of gods proclaimed by Orvanon, they did not entirely lose their desire to worship the unknown. At least they maintain a form of worship up to a few thousand years ago. Notwithstanding their backwardness, these indigo peoples have exactly the same standing before the celestial powers as any other earthly race. These were ages of intense struggles between the various races, but near the headquarters of the planetary prince, the more enlightened and more recently taught groups live together in comparative harmony. Though no great cultural conquest of the world races had been achieved up to the time of the serious disruption of this regime by the outbreak of the Lucifer Rebellion. From time to time, all of these different peoples experienced culture, cultural and spiritual revivals. Nansant was a great teacher of the post-planetary prince days, but mention is made only of those outstanding leaders and teachers who markedly Influence and inspire a whole race. With the passing of time, many lesser teachers arose in different regions, 
And in the aggregate, they contributed much to the sum total of those saving influences, which prevented the total collapse of cultural, cultural civilization, especially during the long and dark ages between the Cal Caliglistia Rebellion and the arrival of Adam. There are many good and sufficient reasons for the plan of evolving either three or six colored races on the worlds of space, though Urantia mortals may not be in a position fully to appreciate all of these reasons, we would call to attention to the following. Variety is indispensable to opportunity for the wide functioning of natural selection, differential survival of superior strains. Stronger and better races are to be had from the interbreeding of diverse peoples when these different races are carriers of superior inheritance factors. And the Arantia races would have been benefited by such an early amalgamation provided such a conjunction, uh, sorry, such a conjoint people would have been subsequently effectively upstepped by a thoroughgoing admixture with the superior atomic stock. The attempt to execute such an experiment on Urantia under persistent racial conditions would be highly disastrous. Competition is healthy, full, stimulated by diversification of races. Differences in status of the races and groups within each race are essential to the development of human tolerance and altruism. Homogeneity and of the human race is not desirable until the people of an evolving world obtain comparatively high levels of spiritual development. Dispersion of the colored races. When the colored descendants of the Sangic family began to multiply, and as they saw opportunity for expansion into adjacent territory, the fifth glacier, the third of geologic content, was well advanced on its southern drift over Europe and Asia. These early colored races were extraordinarily tested for the rigors and hardships of the glacier age of their origin. This glacier was so extensive in Asia that for thousands of years, mig migration to East Eastern Asia was cut off. And not until the later recent retreat of the Mediterranean Sea, consequent upon the elevation of Arabia, was it possible for them to reach Africa. Thus, it was that for almost 100,000 years, these Sangak peoples spread out around the foothills and mingled together, more or less, notwithstanding the, the peculiar but natural antipathy, which early manifested itself between the different races. Between the times of planetary prince and Adam, India became the home of the most cosmopolitan population ever to be found on the face of the earth. But it was unfortunate that this mixture came to contain so much of the green and orange and indigo races. These secondary Sangrik peoples found existence more easy and agreeable in the southern lands, and many of them subsequently migrated to Africa. The primary Sangrik peoples, the superior races, avoided the tropics. The red man going northeast to Asia closely followed by the yellow man, while the blue race moved northwest into Europe. The red man early began to migrate to northeast on the hills of the retreating ice, passing along the high hills and highlands of India, occupying all the northern eastern Asia. They were closely followed by the yellow tribes, who subsequently drove them out of Asia into North America. When the relatively pure line remnants of the red race forsook Asia, there were 11 tribes, and they numbered a little over 7,000 men, women, and children. These tribes were accompanied by three small groups of a mixed ancestry, the largest of these being a combination of the orange and blue races. These three groups never fully fraternized with the red man and early journeyed southward to Mexico and Central America, where they were later joined by a small group of mixed yellows and reds. These people are intermarried and founded a new and amalgamated race, one which was much less warlike than the pure line red man. Within 5,000 years, this amalgamated race broke up into three groups, establishing the civilizations respectively of Mexico, Central America, and South America. The South American offshoot did receive a faint touch of the blood of Adam. To a certain extent, the early red and yellow man mingled in Asia, 
and the offspring of this union journeyed on to the east and along the southern sea coast and eventually were driven by the rapidly increasing yellow race onto the peninsulas and nearby islands of the sea. They are the present day brown men. The yellow race has continued to occupy the central regions of Eastern Asia. Of all the six color races, they have survived in greatest numbers. While the yellow man now and then engage in racial war, they did not carry on such incessant, relentless wars of extermination as were waged by the red, green, and orange men. These three races virtually destroyed themselves before they were finally all but annihilated by their enemies of other races. Since the fifth glacier did not extend so far south in Europe, the way was partially open for these Sangic peoples to migrate to the northwest. And upon the retreat of the ice, the blue men, together with a few other small racial groups, mitigated westward along the old trails of the Adon tribes. They invaded Europe in successive waves, occupying most of the continent. In Europe, they soon encountered the Neanderthal descendants of their early and common ancestor, Adon. These older European Neanderthalers had been driven south and east by the glacier and thus were in position quickly to encounter and absorb their invading cousins of the Sangic tribes. In general, and to start with, the Sangic tribes were more intelligent than Adonic plainsmen, and the mingling of these Sangic tribes with the Neanderthal peoples led to the immediate improvement of the older race. It was the infusion of Sangic blood, more especially that of the blue man, which produced that marked improvement in the, Neander in the Neanderthal peoples exhibited by the successive waves of increasing intelligent tribes that swept over Europe from the east. During the following interglacial period, this new Neanderthal race extended from England to India, the remnant of the blue race left in the old Persian peninsula, later amalgamated with certain others, primarily the yellow and the resultant blend, subsequently somewhat upstep by the violet race of Adam, has persisted as the swarthy normatic tribes of modern Arabs. All efforts to identify the Sangic ancestry of modern peoples must take into account the later improvement of the racial strains by the subsequent admixture of atomic blood. The superior races sought the northern or temperate climes, while the orange, green, and indigo races successfully gravitated to Africa over the newly elevated stuck page land bridge, which separated the westward retreating Mediterranean from the Indian Ocean. The last of the Sangric peoples to migrate from their center of race origin was the Indigo Man, about the time of the Green Man was killing off the orange race in Egypt and greatly weakening himself in doing so. The great black exodus started south through Palestine along the coast, and later when these physical strong Indigo peoples overran Egypt, they wiped the Green Man out of existence by sheer force of numbers. These indigo races absorbed the remnants of the orange man and much of the stock of the green man and certain of the indigo tribes were considerably improved by the racial amalgamation. And so it appears that Egypt was the first dominated by the orange man, then by the green, followed by the indigo black man, and so later by a mongrel race of indigo blue and modified green men. But long before Adam arrived, the blue men of Europe and the mixed races of Arabia Arabia had driven the indigo race out of Egypt and far south on the African continent. As the Sangric migrations draw to a close, the green and orange races are gone. The red man holds North America, the yellow man Eastern Asia, the blue man Europe, and the indigo race has gravitated to Africa. India harbors a blend of the secondary Sangric races and the brown man, a blend of the yellow and red holds the islands off the Asiatic coast. An amalgamated race of rather superior potential occupies the highlands of South America. The pure Andenites live in the extreme northern regions of Europe and, and in Iceland, Greenland, and northeastern North America. During the periods of the farthest glacial advance, the western most of Adon tribes 
came very near being driven into the sea. They lived for years on the narrow southern strip of the present island of England. And it was a tradition of these repleted glacial advances that drove them to take to the sea. When the sixth and last glacier finally appeared, they were the first marine adventurers. They built boats and started in search of new lands, which they hoped might be free from the terrifying ice invasions. And some of them reached Iceland, others Greenland, but the vast majority perished from hunger and thirst on the open sea. A little more than 80,000 years ago, shortly after the Red Man entered northwestern North America, the freezing over the North Seas and the advance of the local ice fields on Greenland drove these Eskimo descendants of the Urantia Aborigines to seek a better land, a new home, and they were successful, safely crossing the narrow straits, which then separated Greenland from the northeastern lands masses of North America. They reached the continent about 2,100 years after the Red Man arrived in Alaska. Subsequently, some of the mixed stock of the Blue Man journeyed westward and amalgamated with the later day Eskimos. And this union was slightly beneficial to the Eskimo tribes. About 5,000 years ago, a chance meeting occurred between the Indian tribe and a lone Eskimo group on the southeastern shores of Hudson Bay. These two tribes found it difficult to communicate with each other, but very soon they intermarried with the result that these Eskimos were eventually absorbed by the more numerous red man. And this represents the only contact in North American red man with any other human stock down to about 1000 years ago when the white man first chanced to land on the Atlantic coast. The struggles of these early ages were characterized by courage, bravery, and even heroism. And we all regret that so many of these sterling and rugged traits of your early ancestors have been lost to the later day races. While we appreciate the value of many of the refinements of advancing civilization, we miss the magnificent per persistency and superb devotion of your early ancestors, which oftentimes broaden on grandeur and sublimity. Presented by a life carrier resident on your rancho. And that ends. This reading, next time, paper 65, The Over Control of Evolution. That should be a fun, fantastic read. Sending each and every one of you love, light, compassion, grace, protection, and shielding energy. Please be safe, be sane. I hope all of you have a fantastic rest of your week. Please go check out my website. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hi to all the new subscribers. How are you? Um, that was a good read. Uh, messed up a bunch. And yeah. Hope everybody has a fantastic day. Congratulations to We Not Me. Today is our one year celebration. So I'm really excited that... I've been doing We Not Me for a year. That's insane. Very, very fun times. So until the next one, guys, be safe, be seen, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.